Good morning, Cherry. Good, Good morning. morning. How is everybody this morning? I wish it was warmer. Wish it was warmer. <laughs> hey, we didn't get any snow last night. That is true. Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. <laughs> I think it'll be too warm for it. I'm going to go with that. We'll stick with light rain or, yeah, or something. Nice. Well, we are so thankful to be here this morning, and we certainly are going to be missing Pastor Mark as he is traveling for work down in warmer San Antonio, Texas. Although uh, Bruce, uh, our friend who is down in Florida, it's even warmer and nicer there, I guess. So. I don't need to hear that. <laughs> oh, well. Well, if you're watching online, please give us a shout out in the comments and let us know you're watching us. Uh, we'd love to know who all is joining us this morning online. In something a little different this morning, we've been posting up our uh, video that we put out for uh, the announcements on our social medias. This morning, uh, I don't know why we had another pass, but threw it out on YouTube and that link is also included in our good morning to everyone that is online this morning so that you can see all the things that are coming up. Uh, so this morning uh, for our announcements, we are, are kicking off Holy Week today. Today is Palm Sunday, and uh, we will be celebrating and shouting Hosanna in the highest uh, because our Lord reigns. This Friday night, we will be having a Good Friday Tenebrae service at 7 p.m., and then we will follow that up with Resurrection Sunday worship next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Now, we sent out an email, we sent out a text, we'll put out one more today. If you haven't voted as to whether or not you wanna have breakfast before worship to next week, get your vote in there, and then uh, Pastor Mark and I'll make that decision based on your input. So it's not all about us, it's about you uh, as well. So. Uh, with that, that leads into our next announcement, which is uh, Men's Breakfast, coming up very quickly on April 6th at 9 a.m. So we invite all the men to join us for that. As it says on here, come hungry, get fed, and that means getting fed in more than one way, both with all the food that we have, as well as getting fed by the word of the Lord. And then the following weekend, we will uh, continue season 19 of Orange Track Racing uh, with Registration at 9.30, racing at 10, and there's always more about that at orangetrackracing.org. For those of you that are watching online, uh, we'll also be posting up the link for the worship music uh, that we'll be singing after the service, so uh, please join us from wherever you're at in singing that. So, that's all said. It's time to slow down just a little bit, center our minds, and prepare for worship. Our call to worship this morning is going to be a little bit different. It's going to come from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 through 29, but it's something that we don't necessarily do a lot. This will be a responsive call to worship this morning. So as you see uh, the words on the screen, the white letters are the ones that I'll be read, and the yellow ones are the ones that we will all read together. But before we do, let's go to God with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this day that you have provided. Father, you are the Lord of all. And even though we have a tendency to forget that, Father, and we try to do things on our own, help us to remember that you are the King of Kings. Lord of Lords, the Most High. Hear our worship today, Father, and may it be a blessing to you. May the words that are said, the teachings that are provided, be ones that we can use not only in our daily lives, but also to deepen our relationship with you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <coughs> and it's actually one through four. I changed it this morning, so. God speaks. You listen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. <coughs> His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat. His, His faithful, faithful love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants, the priests, repeat. His faithful love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord repeat. His faithful love endures forever. 
Open for me the gates where the righteous one enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. The psalmist here is calling on Israel, and not just Israel, but all God's people, which includes us, as well as the house of Aaron and all the priests and all who fear the Lord, to give thanks. Why? Well, the psalmist tells us, because his faithful love endures forever. This is repeated over and over to bring emphasis as to how important this truth is. And we have to remember that... Uh, they couldn't just go to the computer and print it off and boldface it or italicize it or make the words bigger. So they just they repeated it to emphasize that importance. And it's an importance that tells us that this truth is eternal. It tells us that we need to raise our voices and give all the honor and all the glory to God for answered prayer. This is not something that we should be taking for granted. The imagery used in this psalm leads us directly to Jesus. And just like the cornerstone in this psalm, Jesus was rejected and put to death. This morning, each of you has a poem. And as we are about to read in our message this morning and here, these poems were waved by the people as they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. They would lay their cloaks down on the ground as he rode an unridden donkey into Jerusalem. The Savior arrives. War, oppression, slavery, human trafficking, political scandal. Many of you might be thinking that I'm just taking from today's headlines. The fact of the matter is, you're a couple thousand years off. Because these same things, this is something that we've talked about before, both in our travels to and from, as I, as with some of the guys that I pick up in the mornings on Wednesday nights, and nothing has really changed humanly speaking, since the time of Jesus. Yes, we have these little gadgets now, and all those things happen maybe a little bit faster, but they are still happening. On that first Palm Sunday, all these things are going on. The people are expecting Jesus to ride in and to become a warrior Emotions were very high that day. The Jewish people were absolutely fed up with the Roman government, and they were patiently, yeah, maybe not so patient, waiting, though, for the Savior to come. Waiting for the Messiah. And there's even more than that. Jerusalem itself, the Israelites themselves, the Jewish people themselves, we're also divided. I think we've talked about it before, Mark and I both. There are 60-some thousand-plus denominations of the Christian faith throughout the world because we can't come together. I have heard of church, churches literally splitting because they couldn't decide on what color to paint the sanctuary and the color of the carpet to go with it. 
And that breaks my heart. Because we could just as easily, if it was nice enough outside, go out onto the grass and have our service right there. Right on God's carpet. Mm. But they were so divided. And so being a pre-industrial time as it was, it was very much agrarian. There's a word for you. Mm -hmm. And also very patriarchal. And there was this huge gap between the Jewish elite and the working people. Even more of a gap than what we see today between what we call uh, the middle class and the elite. And it was that part of that, this turmoil was due to that gap. Part of it was due to faith. And when we think about their faith, and as we know, there were several different schools of thought. We had the Pharisees. You had the Sadducees. You had the lesser talked about Essenes. You had the Gentiles that were in the area. You had the non-believers of anything. And then you had Jesus' disciples. Sound familiar? Nothing has changed. Some believed when the Messiah came that he would be that warrior king that we just talked about. Freeing them from the Roman rule. Others believed he would be a priestly Messiah. They got it right. Historically, we can see who Jesus was. We can tell without the shadow of a doubt that Jesus existed. He was here. It was written about not just by the disciples and the other biblical writers, but also by the non-believing writers of the time, the historians. Josephus is one of them. He was not a practicing Jew, but he recorded all of these same things, and they line up with the Gospels. Now, the debate today, just as it was then, isn't whether he existed or not, but who he was. Most agree that he was a teacher, a prophet, and even a godly man. There are several major religions that call Jesus out as a teacher or prophet, and a good man, but not as the Son of God. Because he as we well know, is so much more. But this is where the problem comes in. So many people can accept Jesus for those things that are tangible, that they can wrap their minds around, that they can't accept him as the Messiah. That's part of the reason that we chose the study that we just completed on Wednesday night seven words. We spent six weeks listening to the teachings and hearing the teachings and going through a Bible study around those last seven words. We've had the opportunity to learn more about who Jesus was and is because he's not dead. Oh, I didn't mean to break, you know, for next week to break the suspense, but rises. Now, a couple weeks ago, I had a hard time getting a couple of the guys home because there was festivities. There was a parade. Now, who doesn't like a good parade? I mean, I used to remember waking up Thanksgiving morning and racing to the TV, and this is before the remote, so you had to turn it on and actually turn this little rotary dial to get to the station. I don't remember which network carried it, doesn't matter, but it was like, ooh, gotta watch this parade, gotta celebrate with these folks, right? Well, have you ever gotten caught up in that excitement of something? Doesn't matter what it is, but got so caught up in something, and you may not even know what was going on. You were just so super excited about being with all these other people who were excited. Maybe not, maybe you have. But today we're going to embark on the greatest story ever told 
and that fits in with some of the people that will be lining the road as Jesus <coughs> rides into Jerusalem. The events that unfolded over the course of eight days from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday, as we call them now, over 2,000 years ago, changed everything in an instant. As we take this journey from Palm Sunday today to Good Friday and ultimately to Easter Sunday, it is our prayer that you will gain a better understanding not only of the events, but the meaning behind them. Through the writings of Luke and Matthew, we are going to take a step back and discover that first Palm Sunday. Now by this time, Jesus was very well known. Nearly everyone that would be coming to Jerusalem for the Passover feast would have heard something about him. From now, or for now, the way that people felt about Jesus was good. We're about to hear a passage from Luke. And I want you to let your mind take you back in, in an effort to help you do that. We're going to watch a short clip. take you back. As you watch that, you saw as the donkey was walking, the dust kicked up. Let your imagination allow you to smell that dust. Feel the heat of the sun beating down on you. Hear the shouts of the jubilant crowd shouting Hosanna. Shouting blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. If you have your Bible with you and want to join along, turn to Luke chapter 19, starting at verse 28. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he's told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Join me in saying, verse 38, Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And he replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. 
And this isn't anywhere written in here. I didn't even think about it until this morning, but we have some Jesus rocks back there. We've got 1.0 and 2.0. Thank you, Denny, for providing those. But I could, if you guys had not said a word, there's no doubt in my mind that God would have made those rocks shout out. This story was preceded by another. And that was the story of the, or the parable of the 10 servants. And just to give you some context so you know where we're starting here, this, that parable was taught that God expects each of us to grow and to use what we have been given to the best of our ability. The more we're given, the more that is expected. But... As Mark and I tend to say, that's a sermon for another day. But from this passage, and from, uh, there's some, some more to this part in this day that we'll get into in a moment. There are three things that we can draw from. The first is going to be the fulfillment of Scripture. Zechariah, in chapter 9, verse 9, said, Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble. Bless you. Riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. When this was prophesied by Zechariah, there wasn't a king in Jerusalem. And 500 years later, when this prophecy came to be there was not a king in Jerusalem that is not before Jesus rode into town in both times Jerusalem was being ruled by a foreign nation It is in this prophecy and in its fulfillment that Jesus publicly announces that he is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings. Now I'm thinking about the donkey and I'm thinking about the disciples going, say, hey, the Lord needs it and they just let him take it, walked away. That'd be like somebody walking into your house, grabbing your keys and taking your car. Where are you taking my car? Lord needs it. How would you feel about that? I can't. <laughs> and what happens next is the second thing. Is that Jesus' knowledge of what would happen when the disciples went to get that young donkey. He knew. By being here on earth, we knew of his human side. This showed his divinity, his divine omniscience, that he knew all. The disciples started to untie the colt. The owners asked why, and they respond, the Lord needs it. In that time, the subjects of a king were expected to make resources available for his use. And on top of that, because this colt had never been ridden, it was pure and well suited for the king's use. The third thing that we can take from that passage is that the colt, because it had never been ridden, was not going to be easy to ride. Can you imagine trying to ride a horse for the first time? Yeah, they call for that breaking. And that doesn't go very well for a lot of guys. I mean, a lot of people are trying to break that horse in. But by riding in on this horse, or on this colt, excuse me, he showed his dominion over all of creation. He was able to keep this colt calm as he rode in. 
Now, he comes in, because he's riding on a colt, he's coming in as a humble servant. This is a far cry from that warrior king who would have come in showing force by riding in on a horse or in a chariot. The disciples prepared this colt by placing their garments on it, creating a saddle because the colt was holy. And the people lined the, lining the road, praising God and waving the palm branches and spreading their garments out on the road in front of Jesus was out of respect for Jesus as king. This is not unlike what happened in 2 Kings 9. See, Elisha had sent a young prophet to Ramoth Gilead to anoint Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. And when Jehu went back to his fellow officers and they asked what the man had wanted, he told them, This is what the Lord says. I have anointed you to be king over Israel. Then quickly they spread out their cloaks on the bare steps, blew the ram's horn, shouting, Jehu is king. Here they blew the ram's horn to announce the king and laid their cloaks on the steps out of respect. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people's voices announced the king instead of the trumpet and their laying of the garments on the road for respect. Well, this was obviously too much for the Pharisees. They demanded that Jesus rebuke his followers. It was almost as if they were saying, stop them. You can't really believe what they're saying about you, can you? Or you know what they are saying, shouting is blasphemy. Make them stop. Now, the only thing that people had wrong was that Jesus would restore Israel. They had totally missed what the prophets had said about the Messiah. I'm thinking about them trying to get Jesus to make them stop and our daughter Chris is here. She's a teacher in fourth grade. i got to imagine, it's kind of like trying to make a bunch of fourth graders be quiet. They're just not going to listen. Well, they got it wrong. And later in the week, they would turn on Jesus. The Pharisees got it wrong, too. They were motivated against Jesus because he challenged their power and authority. Think about it. How do you feel when someone challenges something you believe in? Pick up the newspaper, watch the news. We can see people button heads all day long because they don't like being challenged. They can't come to the table and have a conversation. The other thing is, is a revolt would have certainly brought the full weight of the Roman army down on them. <clears throat> Jesus told them that if the people were to be silent, that the stones would cry out. In other words, all of creation would be crying out as Jesus announced. As I was writing this, I thought of, of the song, He Reigns by the Newsboys, and it, the first few uh, um, Lines in this song go like this. It's the song of the redeemed. Rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven. Drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation. A love song born of a grateful choir. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns. He reigns. All creation. If we didn't do it, creation would. They didn't understand that Jesus was setting up a, an eternal kingdom rather than a political one. And Jesus setting up a, a, our eternal kingdom, his eternal kingdom for us, there's no better reason to celebrate. Amid all the celebration of the people, as Jesus enters Jerusalem, his mood changes and he begins to weep. In Luke 19, 41 and 44, it's recorded this way. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. 
How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Jesus knew the people were going to reject him. And in doing so, they would be rejecting God's amazing offer of salvation through his son. Those that rejected Jesus as their Lord and Savior would eventually suffer. God would hand over the city to judgment. And in the year 70 AD, Jesus' words would come to pass. As the Roman army would come in, tear down the walls of the city, and destroy the temple. Why? Because the Jews actually did rise up and revolt some 40 years later. Now, Jesus, upon reaching the temple, wow, can you imagine how frustrated he was? He's seeing the temple being used as a marketplace. The passage in Luke is a little bit shorter than the way that Matthew records it. And there's a harmony within the Gospels. It's just like you and I going out and experiencing the same thing and writing it all down afterwards. We're going to have heard different things. We're going to have different takeaways. But let's hear the way that Matthew records this part of it. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, Scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then he returned to Bethany where he stayed overnight. This room, I said, reading this, and I'm immediately transported back to Genesis and Cain and Abel chapter 4, where they both bring their sacrifices to the Lord. And it came down to the quality of their sacrifice and where that sacrifice was coming from. Genesis 4, 2 through 5 records it this way. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. The people were coming to the temple, not with the best portions for sacrifice, but with money to buy whatever was available from the merchants. In addition to this, there were money changers there. Because so many of the people were coming from outside of Israel, outside of Judea, from the foreign countries around. And their money needed to be changed into the special temple coin that would be used to purchase the sacrifice from the people selling the doves and the other animals. And this whole den of thieves thing comes about when, because both the merchants and the money changers were taking advantage of the people. They don't know anything about people taking advantage of people doing. One 
They were deceiving those who did not know the exchange rate. Oh, you don't know the exchange rate? Well, you give me more. <laughs> I need more for these two coins. And two, they were selling at inflated prices. Sounds like roses at Valentine's Day, or tulips at Mother's Day. Price goes up by 100%. The focus on the worship of the one true and living God was replaced by commercialism and materialism. As Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. This is just one of the things that turn people off from the church today. They see churches as a business and not a house of worship. That's why we try so hard to make this a house of worship, a place where people can come and learn and grow and mature in their faith. When Solomon had de dedicated the temple, he prayed that God would hear the people's prayers, forgiving, healing, defending and blessing them. And instead, the people were just trying to make a buck. On top of all the noise, how could anyone that was there actually worship God? We've all been to the farmer's market downtown. It's wall-to-wall -wall people. You can barely hear yourself think. Imagine that, and you're trying to worship God in all of that chaos. same goes for us throughout our lives. Do we take time and slow down? This week, I was helping a lady with her, her phone, and at the end of the call, after we got it taken care of, I was taken aback when she said, can I pray for you? Got a little misty. And as she prayed over me, She prayed a blessing. She had no idea that I was going to go home after work. Or, well, I was already home. I was going to leave my work office and go to the personal office and work on the sermon for today. And we talked about that a little bit before we hung up, and I told her how much of a blessing it was. She broke through the noise. What is the noises in your life that are keeping you from time with God? When will you take time to worship Him and shout for joy at all that He has done and is going to do for you? Life is full of all kinds of trouble, all kinds of distractions, pressure that some of us can't even imagine what others are going through. Let God use you through whatever you're going through. And in doing so, he will help you to grow as a result. We talk about those tests become testimonies. But what you were going through, God will allow you, if you allow him to, will use you to help someone else going through the same type of situation. Now, sometimes what he's asking of us doesn't make sense. But there's good news. That happened to the disciples too, remember? Go get that donkey. Okay. I mean, by that time they come. To, they, they were pretty used to being told to go do things that they didn't understand. But we have to remember, as that passage told us, Jesus is the source of our peace. Cling to Him, and trust in what God is doing in your life. Daily seek Him. Spend time in the Word, and talk to Him. Palm Sunday to me is a time of reflection, a time of repentance, a time of remembrance. And I brought something this morning that I keep. At one point I was going to use it in the ashes that we use on Ash Wednesday, but I never have. And Lori suggested maybe I take this and have it frame, put between glass and framed. But this palm, and it's in this bag because it's a little bit in pieces, 
is from Palm Sunday, 1983. Notre Dame in Paris. It was a service that I did not understand because they don't use microphones. It's the, it echoes through the chamber there. It's beautiful the way that that does. And my French wasn't that good to capture everything that they were saying. But you could sense and feel God working. The same would happen many years later when we would have a Burundi congregation come to another church that I was serving at and ask to be able to use the sanctuary for services because they didn't have a church home. And so I went to one of their services and it was all in their native tongue. Now, they were kind, and they brought an interpreter, so the service went much longer. But the music that they sang, didn't understand the words, but in my heart, in my soul, I knew that God was talking. We have to daily seek Him, daily spend time with Him in the Word, Talk to him and listen to him. Jesus, you enter Jerusalem to shouts of joy. The crowds put their garments on the road, waving palm branches and crying out, Hosanna. Today I pray for repentance, Father. I pray for renewal and revival in your church around the world. You have already forgiven us for our sins. Please, please save us from ourselves and our sins as we rejoice in you. Lord God, because of your love, your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness, we are eternally blessed. Today and throughout the coming week, we celebrate your great gift to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving, or thank you for bringing your kingdom here to us. You sent Jesus, who came to us humbly, riding on a donkey, and instead of war, he proclaimed peace and provided each of us a way to salvation. Let us accept that free gift, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. What we are about to celebrate is something that will be happening this week during this Holy Week. When Jesus has his final meal with his disciples. After washing their feet as a servant, he washes their feet. I can't say this enough. Judas too. They sat down for the Passover meal. And it's in that meal that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And giving the pieces to the disciples, he said, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. A little later in the meal, after singing some hymns, he took the cup and after filling it said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. Scripture reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do so until Christ returns. The body of Christ broke the healing. Take the healing. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, this meal represents so much more and, than we can ever imagine. And it takes on extra meaning for us as we celebrate this Holy Week. As we go from this jubilant celebration of Jesus riding into Jerusalem as King. To Him humbly serving His disciples. Eating the final meal. And turning Himself 
over after Judas betrays him. Father, your son came and took the, the punishment for our sin. And he died on the cross. But Father, thank you. Thank you that just a few days later we are able to rejoice in the fact that he rose and that he has given us a way to salvation and that we are made righteous in your eyes. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Now this is where we normally see Denise come up. She is recovering from neck surgery this past Wednesday. So we wish her very all uh, healing and that she becomes well from that. Are there other prayer requests that you all have? My friend coworker Sharon, her grandson is having surgery this week. Say son or grandson? Grandson. Grandson. Jace. Well, Father, we lift up Jace. We pray that the doctors and nurses and his caregivers can find a way for him to better tolerate the treatments that he is going through. This is a treatment, Father, and a, a disease that I can't even begin to imagine, Father, but I know you know and you are in control, and you will take care of him. Be not only with him and his caregivers, but be also with his family, who are very worried about him as he goes through this. Father, we lift up Denise, and thank you that the surgeons were able to get in and do the procedure that they needed to do, and to bring her relief from her pain. We just pray that as she continues to heal, that each day would be better and better. I would pray for Mark, who is currently traveling this week in San Antonio for work. We pray that he is able to get the rest that he needs and to not be pushed beyond his abilities as he still continues to heal from his knee surgery. Father, I give you thanks and praise and honor that this third declotting surgery that Amanda went through, our daughter, finally did the trick and she can now move her arm and she has her mobility back. But I just pray that she's able to go through the steps that she needs to do to get on the transplant list and that she can get a kidney and have a long and fulfilling life. Father, we have so many names on our prayer list. Prayer, we are praying for so many people to come into a relationship with you, Father. These are people that may have known you and were hurt by your people, not by you. Or don't know you at all. Or kind of know who you are, but have rejected you. And Father, we pray for a softening of their stony hearts. That they would come to have a heart of flesh and that they would be open to hear your message. Father, puts people in their lives to show them your love. For those that are sick and hurting on our list, Father, we just, we pray for them, but there are so many others out there that we also lift up, Father. You know all the names. You know all the situations. You know all the outcomes. We not only pray for the people, but the people around them, their friends and their family, and even their co-workers who are dealing with watching their friend, their family member, or their co-worker go through what they are. You, Father, are the physician who can heal all. You can get us through whatever we need to, Father. Let us get the peace that we can only get through Jesus. His precious name. Amen. This does bring us to the end of our online portion of our service.
For those of you who are online, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you can at some point join us in person. As we close this time of prayer, or this time of the worship in prayer, hear this Lenten prayer. Lord God in heaven, we pray for you to move against the forces of evil. Lord God, we ask that your mighty power would bind Satan and all of his minions from every aspect of our lives, as well as those of our family, our church family, our co-workers. It is in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, that we ask you to bind all the forces of darkness and disband them with your light. Throw the enemy forces into confusion, hamper their plans, shut down their schemes so that they will not prosper in their rebellion against you and we, your people. We pray that any and all support of those who do evil in your sight would be dissolved, and we pray that their hard hearts would be softened, and they would turn to you, Father God, that they would be made right in your sight through the salvation that comes through our accepting of your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, let us have eyes to see past the deception of the enemy, and instead of rebellion, there would be repentance. Draw us ever closer to you, Father. Open our eyes to see that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the commander of heaven's armies, the most high God. Lord, send your warring and protecting angels to surround us and protect us from all evil. I pray that all the forces of evil that are working against the efforts of Grace Street Church our church family and friends, and our, that they would be bound away and that they would be overcome by your mighty power. Lord Jesus, we claim this as a victory in your name, and we know that by calling on your name that you will protect us. All glory, honor, and praise to you forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen.